going to talk today a lot about uh, independent films, actually, um, just because that's been a lot of my work in the last year or so. And you can see my work kind of takes over a pretty solid range. So here I've got a, a bit of smattering of my last few years of work, which is big budget movies uh, with Matt Damon. I was Elysium. Small series I did with Vice, actually, uh, last year called Post Radical. That was all documentary comedy. Yeah. And then um, a mix of uh, independent films, uh, animated films, and a sort of medium budget sci-fi. So I have a good fair share of dystopian sci-fi in, uh, in my reel. So um, what I love about film, uh, Baselight is that uh, ultimately all of the work that I do is done in a layer base. You can kind of get a sense of that through looking at a project. This is a, you know, a demo project, so I've got a bunch of different shots in this scene here. But it's really intuitive uh, coming from, say, a Photoshop uh, point of view where you're learning to apply looks and the color changes to um, images in a layered way, so you can kind of go back and make sort of subtle changes, and then, um, you know, kind of work in that way with the DP or the director, so they can kind of make changes and see the work along the way. It's just really intuitive as a photographer to come from that space, and, and a lot of the tool set actually kind of came there as well. I find that it's a way that I can be, you know, really collaborative with a varied group of um, creative leads. And I thought maybe I would frame this uh, and the work that I've done just in like a, a few different um, creatives that I've worked with. This is a film, short film, um, that was actually a Neil Blomkamp movie uh, called Firebase. And this was a, a lot of visual effects. And again, his work is driven by um, tons of VFX. So a lot of the times what we're doing with him is working with the visual effects supervisors um, and getting them in the room to have a look at how their visual effects are translating on screen. It's super important as a creative to be able to see, you know, from the color point of view, because we're kind of the last uh, step along the way, to see what was the intent, what were the creative choices in the suite that were you know, going into the visual effects sessions. And now what we're imply like, putting them into one big scene, how do they translate on the screen and what kinds of changes might I do that may enhance or distract um, from a visual effect uh, shot. And I think that's really, really interesting um, and really valuable actually to have that collaboration. The nice about Baselight is it lets you kind of keep all your versions in the timeline. Um, so you can layer things, um, you can create kind of anything you want, um, as many versions as you would like in the same working space, and then, you know, work in and inside and outside of those visual effects and blend them or different layers or different shots together. In the last couple of years, I found that I've been working a lot with directors, um, and the DP wasn't in the room as much, um, which is a little bit stra strange as the colorist, because I always feel like the, the color grading part is really an extension of the DP's work. Because a lot of the times you get to, you know, relight a scene, you might have to do that work, um, you know, as you, as you go along. And without the DP there, you can really um, change their photography. And so I've been doing a lot of grading sessions with DPs at remotely. And one of the things that's really great um, for me is that we actually work on the same screen. You'll see my cursor and me drawing things on the screen as we go. So as we're talking, it's easy for you to see what I'm doing. And I find that that's actually really kind of a flowy way to work and communicate, especially if you're in another room or another country. Um, but back to visual effects, just wanted to talk about this project a little bit. Um, this one is Zygote, and this is another short with Neil that I did last uh, a year and a half ago. And um, just to, to the point of working with visual effects and be able to kind of inter integrate with them, we did actually did a collaboration where the VFX supervisor, Chris Harvey, he was in the room prior to the director. So we get a chance to actually look through all the visual effects as they were cut in and then make changes to um, what end up being called Jazz Hands, which is this <laughs> zygote character that's made up of all kinds of human body parts, but we dubbed him Jazz Hands because it was a really funny name. But it was kind of nice to be able to talk through all of the different, you know, things that went into 
uh, putting this together. And then even on kind of a small budget, because this is a short film and is independently made, um, collaborate pretty quickly on the, just the different items and the, the, um, you know, the shadows and the kinds of details that they were putting into the visual effects. But this is a short, mm, short sort of medium-sized film that was actually a multi-projector um, map image mapping of a short film. I call it more of an experience, <laughs> but it's called Uninterrupted. And it was a um, massive installation underneath a bridge in Vancouver uh, that ran every night for two or three months. And this one was a really cool project, both for Baselight, which is it's another whole session to talk about how we did this with Baselight. But you can see here, it's the images, there's ma they're made up of, like this whole film is made up of a variety of images. And this is a film that would play in a three-dimensional space. So they had edited it in, um, in a VR, that they previewed it in VR. And then we actually put together all these individual images in Baselight and actually had them play simultaneously, and then they put them back together and mapped it um, off across six projectors uh, onto the bridge. And what was interesting about the collaboration on this one was that we were actually able to install a small system at the bridge once they project it. This is the first time we'd actually have seen it in this space. And um, visualize, you know, finally see how the images were landing on the screen. We did a lot of really kind of custom modifications in our theater to create this sort of effect of images being projected kind of largely. Once we got it here, we had a small little grading <laughs> station where we were able to kind of cue and customize um, grades and draw shapes across different parts of the image to allow this, you know, that experience of watching um, to really change based on the 3D space. But what was really cool about that was having a chance to work with sound design at that time it just enabled me to be in that process with the sound designer where we would be drawing the eye visually, but the sound designer was saying, actually, I want the sound to come from over here and I want people to look over this way. So we actually were able to kind of integrate um, and change color on the fly there so that we could play with the audience's experience, which was pretty rare, and but really cool. A main part of Baselight coming into play was the option of being able to play you can see, so there's maybe five, sometimes six different types of images on the screen that are coming together. With Baselight, we were able to actually show, this isn't going to be exactly what I mean to show, but we were able to show multiple versions, multiple timelines at the same time, and then I was able to kind of tweak between those and grade the top three to match and the other ones to be darker because they were going to be in another space. And we had that alongside of um, the sort of three-dimensional um, preview of, of what was going to be projected, which was really cool. And I don't know if there's another way that we could have done that, to be honest. When it comes to collaboration, I feel like it's becoming more and more common now for me um, is to collaborate with other colorists. And this is a still from a project called Mandy. Some of you may have heard of this film. Um, this is actually a project where my role was look development colorist. And some people say, what does that mean? Uh, well, it means that I spent uh, a few days with the director and the DP in the same room where we looked at the original uh, footage and we talked about what the process was going to be, how we were going to get to the, the final result. This film was actually quite, if, some, if you haven't seen it, it's quite an intensely colorful, looky film. Um, and so I actually did the work in Vancouver with the DP and the director, and we came up with um, a few different looks, but we actually then moved using uh, Baselight, both myself and the other colorist, Peter Berners, who was in Belgium at the time, he was able to open my project, use my grades, and then work off of them, and then they actually came back to me, and I worked off of them with the, the director, and then he worked with the DP, and it was an interesting collaboration, um, but you can see that one of the things that we did to get through that film was we just established a way of working that was pretty clear and um, easy to work with, which was setting up um, a system of layering um, that's pretty, you know, basically kind of straightforward, but it allows us to give very simple visual direction of what we worked on um, and th the kinds of um, grades we were doing in each layer. And then we basically established that as a language and we were able to work kind of quickly back and forth. Once we got more, you know, intensely into it, uh, we found that, you know, we were adding things in past, you know, say layer eight or six 
you know, we were doing our own thing to get to that result. This film, again, like I said, it was quite, you can see just going through some of the stills, it was quite a strongly looking film. Um, and that that's another, you know, the sort of final um, collaborator I like to talk about as the director, which is essentially um, somebody that you work with, or I find that I work with, that has a much bigger picture kind of view on the project. Um, and I did this actually with Panos because he had this very bold idea about color. He wanted the color in this film to be about texture. He wanted to push it as far as possible. And the only way that we could get there would be actually by pushing it in, say, seven or eight different directions and then kind of <laughs> choosing one of those extreme directions and then nuancing it as the project, you know, as the film rolls forward. But this is one way that I often work where I like to kind of choose a number of extremes. In this particular case, I did this for almost every single sequence where we could basically look at how, you know, how intense, how strong that uh, color effect would go across everything um, or not, or just in certain scenes, and then go from there. And it kind of is a really quick, kind of a sandbox way to work, where you're kind of playing around. You get to see what works, what doesn't, and then you can, you know, roll forward with what you like. A lot of these images of uh, Mandy, these are actually all shot very similar. I mean, we pushed the color in these, but they were all shot actually quite boldly where there wasn't necessarily a lot of place to move. Whereas something like that shot, um, uh, you know, something like this, this would be shot kind of straightforward, but again, Panos knew, I'm actually gonna take that red stripe in the truck and I'm just gonna jack the color out of it so that it looks really graphic and, um, you know, really puts you in a different kind of like fantasy space. He kind of came at it, was like, well, I wanted to be really colorful, I don't know what, it, what that means, you know. It didn't, this one was sort of shot more, you know, straight, it was more in the cinematography of the, the graphic of the water, but not necessarily, um, the color of it wasn't, you know, defined in any specific way. But I think that he'd always planned for that, but I don't think it was as specific. You know, I think it was more of like, oh, that's interesting. Let's go more. Let's go more. It was also a bit of an ode to Super 16. It was originally in the script to say to be presented on Super 16 mil film, which we all laughed at because they weren't actually going to do that, um, even though the DP had a moment where he thought, is that is this actually going to happen? But because it was not, it was shot in Aerie, um, we actually did a, a bit of work figuring out the grain um, and how we were going to have the grain play throughout the film. And with in Baselight, we actually did this, um, where we had the controls in the, the color grading suite, so we were able to establish like an overall grain. Um, and then as this, the film rolls on, we're able to kind of pick and choose the intensity um, and the level of how the film responds to the the image, the grain responds, how colorful it is, how not color, in this particular case, it was not very colorful that we chose, but we could play with all of those and see how that translated um, across the film. But in this, in this film, we were actually, because we could do it shot by shot, we were actually doing that um, per scene is from the look development side, I was able to just establish certain colors and certain types of grain by scene. And then that was rolled forward um, through the final. Uh, I used to work, um, uh, with a company that used to create like a, a, a grain layer in a different way. And we used to do um, full grain passes on films and then like really intense grain passes with that software. So it was kind of, it came, you know, it was an offline software, brought it online with a full, um, so the full film in full grain mode and the, the um, ungrained film, and then we'd use Baselight to blend them. That was actually my old way of working. It was really interesting, because it's sort of like, it, it's basically provided the same result that we were getting, and we were finding that after doing that a few shows in, we didn't do that anymore. Um, so I found that, that the grain tools quite, I mean, it's just, it's, you could see there's kind of a range in how you can use it. And for most films, we can get away with, you know, a lot of people just really want a little subtle grain that mixes and blends. And because there's a kind of a bit of, you know, nuance with that grain, we find it works pretty well. But I've, you know, there's a lot of projects, you know, that I've been talking about lately where they're considering shooting it to film uh, at the end of it again and scanning it back. So I think it kind of just depends on how intense it needs to blend and how natural it is. You, I think you know, with any software that creates grain, um, you, you, you feel the, the pattern of it regardless of, of um, how natural it's meant to feel. So me getting used to it, I, just, I find that I use it in a really subtle way. I usually just play with the size of it and then just how it blends is, is usually pretty subtle. 
So this is Prospect, and this is a sci-fi uh, independent film that I worked on as well last year. There is uh, an element of dust floating around in the air, which we call this the pink dust. In different parts of the film, this gets more intense or not, depending on the story point. That actually we composited in the base light on the fly while we were grading as well to sort of be able to play with that element as, uh, as a story point, but as the color shifted and changed in the film. So we were kind of played a lot with just getting the image to, you know, wh what would happen with um, moving the image to a warm space as the sun's kind of setting and playing with, you know, a kind of a, a little bit of a warmer sunset -y look. One of the things we did a lot where we, we graded the shot sort of more photographically and then we would go into um, this base grade and like just lift the blacks a little bit, which everybody said, oh, lifted blacks, that's a great look. But it was really actually kind of challenging to get that to work across the whole film without it just looking like a one overall, um, you know, kind of a look. So we would, you know, come up with a really strong look um, for the film as it was without that dust layer uh, and then kind of get to a certain point and decide, okay, now we have to integrate the dust. So each uh, shot and scene of the movie, they, they actually shot their own dust plates. So there'd be elements that would track and follow with the movement of the camera so that it looked you know, as real as possible. We were able to actually put the dust layer in um, as we were working. And essentially um, what I was do able to do was kind of work in how strong, and it had to be a certain color, but we could cue the color as we went. And it was basically um, kind of, you know, really fast for us to work on how strong or how subtle it was gonna be depending on the scene and how that would play with the color. Because obviously it's pink, it had a certain tone. And so we would, you know, basically go shot by shot or at least scene by scene to play with the intensity of that dust and, and see how it would kind of like come across with the overall look. Not to mention we're matching different times of day and trying to get th that all to work. Um, this was sort of the final element. And that's kind of why we left it a little bit to the side. So here's sort of just an example of that, that final scene, how it played. And we kind of came to a little bit of so soft, subtle look, but we wanted it to, of course, to be really different from the daylight stuff that we had. Not that I have it on the fly, but then another sh sequence that we did as it went in tonight. This was probably, this is kind of a fun, a funny story that we probably graded this one six or seven different ways. <laughs> um, once we'd established the overall contrast and how it was going to feel, then we put the dust in and we found the dust to kind of, you know, um, play differently um, with this, the first look that we came to. So we actually changed our uh, strategy and I think with the director and the, the two directors went back and forth with what they liked. <laughs> um, Left it for a week or so while they finished more visual effects and came back to it and then we actually graded it quite a different way. I do, I do do a lot of that like going towards that kind of mood board so I create a lot of things which I think I know Obviously, I take into consideration the source image. So if I have something that they've given me, I usually start with that. Okay, what does this just feel like? So, you know, as I was working earlier, I would just kind of take a shot and just kind of like feel around where, you know, where that image like looks to me just generally where I like it to be. That might be just like a base grade, but it might be a little bit creative. And then I'll try to work in conceptual ideas. But usually, um, like to answer your question, I usually do some really extreme ones, because I feel like um, without that, you don't really get as much of a reaction. So you make an extreme and then it, you know, again, you can pull that back, um, but you don't, but without going as far, you may not see something, you know, super interesting. So I find that it's kind of nice to be able to, you know, go kind of far with something and then have somebody react to it more so than, you know, just kind of, just being kind of conservative with it. So in a broad, like when we're doing a grade like this in a broadcast room, let's say, or doing something for series, um, you, t you know, colors typically have a monitor like this that it was visible to everybody. That's kind of the high end, you know, HDR capable monitor. And then we'd have kind of a more, you know, true to life um, display. Typically they're calibrated to look very similar, like within, you know, within limitations that they have. Um, and then when you're in a theatrical space, you remove all the monitors and you really both just focus on the, the theatrical, the screen. 
Right, so if you're going theatrical first, you do all of, you know, primarily all the creative, knowing what's coming, all the creative in the theater. Um, and this is probably my most common process. So I do that, and then basically we take that, bring it into a small room, and we do the work, you know, try to, as best as possible, estimate. We d I don't do a lot of comparing the two. Um, I actually take an approach where I encapsulate it in my memory, what it felt like, what it looked like to me in that room, and how that experience was, and then watch it on the small screen and go with my gut on what's different, what needs to change to make that as similar as experience as possible. And then that, of course, ex expands to working on an SDR monitor in HDR version and, and you know, the complexity of that as well. I just did a project, actually. I'm working on a pilot of a, of a series where we were playing around with um, that DRT in terms of, you know, what the color space. A lot of people are used to, uh, especially if they're shooting ARRI, they're used to just working in the ARRI um, log color space. And that can, you know, yield certain results. Um, we also have, which I didn't have loaded up here, but the TCAM, which is the true light version kind of of that. Um, ACE's uh, scene referred working space, but then in this particular project, yes, I have it set up in ACE's. Um, I actually did a lot of work with ACE's early on before it was embedded into um, Baselight or, or Resolve or what have you software. And so I find it, I'm quite comfortable with how the image moves in ACE's. So for me, when I set up a project, I'll always start in ACE's if I can and see um, you know, how it feels and how the image responds that way. Sometimes it doesn't, we, don't, we don't get to that the same place that we might want to, so that one might be a reason to switch. Um, but creatively, I find I don't approach it from the way it looks when we, we load it up. So when ACES, you know, we apply ACES, we work in that, that sort of original look. Um, to me, that's just kind of a container that's bigger than anything that we're going to deliver. So I actually don't, it doesn't affect me creatively so much as it is how the, Im the controls move. Um, and I think that's maybe a little bit different a way of thinking about it, but um, so I d it doesn't bother me so much as much as I can get to the end result, you know, in terms of the look that they, they want. Um, and something like Prospect, we used it so that we could get that lifted blacks and sort of the dust sort of very nuanced. And then so we could switch right away and make our Rec 709, you know, broadcast version without having to regrade the whole film. Um, just because it was, there's a lot of little subtle effects. And so they loved the way the Aces worked with these different looks that we were able to create, different LUTs that we had. And it just kind of gave them that result up front, so we just went ahead with it. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, I usually lean on the, you know, the project content and, you know, the DP and the director and, and what they want. Also for visual effects, it's really great to use Aces. So there's, there's, you know, reasons to do that and not to do it. But usually when I'm on a visual effects heavy project, I'm finding more and more they're asking, can we can we get, you know, Aces files? So. The last two projects I'm on, I've been given scripts and I get the chance to kind of work with the, the pre-production phase. Typically, uh, what we've been doing is sort of just doing a, you know, as the camera's uh, tests will happen, we'll do a look development session that's pretty quick, but upfront just to kind of get a sense so that the DPs know what their range is, um, at least towards the target that they want to hit. And then we, we can actually, from that, we, I've done both where we export out um, either LUTs directly from Baselight or BLG files that go into visual effects, say, into Nuke, so that they can play with them in compositing um, track along the way. Uh, but I actually do that quite a lot. And usually I create a range, so either one sort of major overall look LUT, and then scene-specific ones, depending on how extreme the look needs to be. So the DP of Mandy is, uh, goes by the name of Benjamin Loeb, and his style of capturing is actually uh, darker. So we, um, I think he did a, a kind of a blend. I would say like 50% of the film was captured more traditionally, and then another 50% was captured very, you know, with a lot of red color gels, lots of deep 
um, tones and then captured it in a bit of a darker way. Um, I don't think it was terribly specific, but I know his style, having worked with him on a few shows, that he leans more towards the sort of denser negative. Um, and yes, knowing that we were going to go quite extreme um, in terms of the final look, I think that was like, it, it helped us a lot in terms of that because it gave us a quite a bit of range to go, you know, four or five different <laughs> full color ways if we wanted to. Since the, uh, the entry of this base grade um, tool, which has kind of become my new, new favorite first layer, um, first operator that I use, which I really love in terms of you know, getting um, a little bit more interesting kind of curve, and it kind of plays with the image a lot more cleaner than, um, say, using a video or a film grade. Um, and then, bec because I did a feature right, uh, right as soon as that came out, uh, Prospect was the feature that came out right as uh, right as base grade was coming uh, was released. I I loved it as well because I was able to play with the tool set like the flare or the contrast that just plays a little bit differently on the image. I also really love that you can see in all my stacks I have the color temperature, um, which I use a lot in uh, uh, you know overall. Um, just again, because it has a kind of a more uh, filmic way of moving the image around, just in terms of the bias. And then, of course, you know, something that when you're talking to DPs, when they talk about temperature, it's a, it's a very familiar uh, way of working, like in terms of how it, it works on the image. For them, it often just reacts the way that they're expecting it to. Uh, I also use that, um, which I could, I've been told by Daniele that I could use the, the base grade the same way, but I use the color temperature um, actually as a way to um, play with highlights as well. It might just be that it's intuitive because it, we, I use this tool, the knob tool set to do it, but I really like the exposure, how quickly it reacts in terms of trying to get, let's say, detail back in the fire, um, or not, let's say, to kind of s you know play with that curve just in the upper end. So I do a lot. I do a lot of keys and then play with either the base grade or the color temperature to kind of get that little those little effects. So we start again. You were asking about somebody was asking about the thickness of of the the original. So it was typically shot pretty dark, but often what I'll do to get something like this is I'll play a little bit around with like how, where this image is sort of set to land, just in terms of the overall exposure. So I use base grade. Sometimes uh, in that world, if I'm, again, if I'm doing visual effects, I'm used to using the offset a lot, which is the film grade. Um, and you play around with the balance there as well. Um, just to kind of get me in a pocket where I think, you know, th that's where they want it to go. And kind of don't worry too, too much about the the contrast up front, because I know I can tweak that as I go. But it's more just to kind of see, like, where does that image kind of land for us? Um, in this particular film, we did a lot of work. Um, just, just This is just in look development, so there's a lot more work after I did that um, with Peter. We did a lot of work with, like, kind of drawing, you know, drawing attention in towards the character a ton. Um, and then also just playing with just different places where we would get it color out of this image. Um, there's actually another element of color in this sequence that I don't have that we would blend in, but there's a lot of flares that were put into the film as it went, um, as part of the look. Just putting, pushing color into different places. So he, in this shot, I remember working with just like getting, seeing if we can get some blue, almost like a tint to that window, um, and playing a little bit with the movement of the trees behind the window. So we kind of just play with a kind of a bit of an extreme grad. And then again, to play with um, her, you know, what, c what came up in the image, uh, what we could get, how we could focus on her without necessarily um, bringing the whole shot up, because we wanted to keep that kind of deep, colorful feel. Um, but then just kind of playing a little bit with, you know, bringing her up or adding color to her skin tone, that sort of thing. Um, and that keeps you kind of in the in the zone of this particular scene. Again, this is a pretty quick quick scene, but so th this particular show was a bit of more of a black and white grain, so we play with blending that in. And just so I can remember what it, what it was, roughly, something around there. I usually up the intensity so I can see what the quality of that grain is, and then I just kind of play it into the place where I think it belongs. Again, this, this example is not going to push me as far as this actually would have gone. But I would just kind of, what I often do with this stuff is I just kind of play around with what, you know, what, what feels right 
you know, what kind of different things I can get out of the image. In this particular case, we were playing with a lot of, you know, colorizing of the blacks, but not to the point where, you know, they were all lifted, like in something like Prospect, where they had a brown kind of a tone. We wanted them to kind of feel colorful, but not, not too much. And then get a little bit of sort of warmth out of the, the shadows. And actually in this shot, I think we did too, a little bit of work around, um, you know, sort of taking your eye off of any of these glints, but having them still be visible. So adding color, you know, to the foreground and then, you know, knocking back things like that, just to kind of like draw your eye in. Um, and again, as you can see, as I've added those things, I can always go back to them, bring them up as they're working, as I keep making changes so that I can take things away. 